welcome to Silicon Curtain Podcast. All our content is now available on podcast platforms if you haven't discovered us there. Uh, but obviously you get the lovely visuals on uh, YouTube. Uh, and if you are looking at us on YouTube, do like, subscribe and comment. Comments really do help the videos to perform in the algorithm and it helps new people to discover the amazing guests that we feature on the channel. Please do also check out the verified Ukrainian charities that we uh, list in the description of this video. Uh, it's incredibly important, more important now than ever, to help keep Ukraine resilient and ensure that it has the support and funds it needs to uh, help its veterans and, of course, to keep fighting Russian aggression. Today, I'm delighted to be joined again by Mark Galliotti, who is an author and academic. By training, he's an historian, and in practice, he's an interdisciplinary scholar with interests encompassing politics, criminology, security studies, international relations, and anthropology. And I think we're going to hit a fair few number of those topics in today's conversation. He's a specialist in transnational and organized crime, security affairs, Russian politics, Russian history, intelligence, and security. He's principal director at Mayak Intelligence and an honorary professor at SSES at UCL, also a senior associate fellow at the Royal United Services Institute. We're also going to put links to his incredible books in the description of the video. If you have not checked out his most recent ones, please do. Uh, every single one of them are excellent, but you might as well start with the most recent ones and then work your way down from there. Mark, welcome back to the channel. Well, it's good to be here again. Um, I'm I'm hopefully going to ask a few questions. I know you do a, an absolute ton of media interviews and there's always a, an element of paranoia on my side that I'm going to be firing questions at you that you've already answered, you know, two dozen times. But let's let's go for it. Let's see if we can try and find a different angle. And I'm going to start with this idea of the Russian way of war, the Russian way of fighting and losing. Has that changed in the last two to four hundred years? Well, look, everyone's way of war has has changed. I mean, ultimately, it's a combination of you know, technology, the fairly uh, you know, unavoidable constraints of, of demographics and geography and such like, but also the goals to which to which military action is, is put. So what I would say is, I mean, it's an interesting question, and I'm, I'm glad that we, we're going to be spending the next hour with my answer to it, but no, no, I shall try and compress it is when it comes down to it, Russian strategic culture hasn't changed all that much. Um, in other words, the, the top level understanding of what is a threat and what, what do you do about those kind of threats. What has changed is the practical ways in which actually that's been addressed. Now, look, a country like Russia, the, there's always been this sort of myth that it relies entirely on just simply throwing large numbers of, of people at any kind of, of, of a threat. And look, obviously, that's not entirely mythical. But even if we look at many of the engagements in, in the Second World War, actually, the Russians were not massively outnumbering their Axis uh, sort of antagonists. But in fact, they often in their own rather brutish and clumsy way sometimes, but nonetheless also demonstrated considerable tactical proficiency. Likewise, you know, we, we should remember that when they invaded Ukraine in 2022, part of their problem was precisely they didn't have enough troops for dealing with a fully mobilized Ukraine that, contrary to Putin's expectations, was not just simply about to roll over, but instead had been basically for eight years, preparing precisely how to fight this war. So I think, you know, we, we have a way of war which tends to be, on the one hand, offensively or direction. I mean, basically, the best way to fight a war is on someone else's real estate is pretty much their, their view. Yes, you, you can trade off territory for time if need be, but you'd much rather not. It is one that does believe in the advantage and the value of preemption. I mean, when it comes back to it, it's what Putin himself said. One of the key lessons he learned in his childhood, so running with street gangs in Leningrad, as was then, was that if you're going to get into a fight, you, you basically throw the first punch. It's a way of war that is often deeply, um, I think, uh, cynical in its use of manpower, in that in some ways it, it re often regards manpower as ammunition. Now, the point is ammunition is valuable. You don't necessarily waste it, but nor do you spend too much time in, in the heat of the moment worrying about whether it, this is the time to use it or not. 
But all that said, I think that we also have to distinguish, and I'm throwing far too many variables into this, but unfortunately, it's all your fault for the question you asked to, to head off with. Um, it's also, we have to acknowledge that the way of war will always be diffracted through the prism of the current political environment. And if we look at what's happened in Russia, I mean, for example, the massive levels of corruption, something like, you know, according to the main military prosecutor, up to 40% of all procurement money was embezzled. Well, that clearly had a carryover into actually the capabilities. And although the Russian generals were thinking about sort of fighting a very modern, high tech, fluid war, when you find yourself that your trucks can't run because instead of good proper tires, they've got cheap Chinese rubbish and your encrypted radios, actually you open up the case and it's just a you know cheaper little walkie talkie inside. You know, suddenly you are forced to fight a different kind of war. Or Ukrainians have coded the software and it's already pre-hacked. Which, uh... Well, yeah, but it, but in some ways, at, at least that is genuine enemy action. That is done by the enemy rather than yourself to yourself. Um, so, I mean, I think in this context, what I would say is the Russian way of war, the strategic culture hasn't changed that much. The problems of corruption, incompetence, and often just simply recalcitrance, frankly, within the military hasn't changed that much over time. What has changed, though, is how when these come to bear on the kind of the realities of the battlefield, quite what kind of a war is fought? Because, in fact, one could look at, I don't know, 1812 and the battles against Napoleon. One could look at the Great Patriotic War and one can look at recent conflicts. And although there are commonalities, these are also very, very different types of wars. So, look, the honest answer is, and, I'm, and I apologize for giving such a roundabout way to such a weak conclusion, is there is a Russian way of war. But it's it's much more, I would suggest, um, of the moment rather than of some kind of grand notion that is coded in their DNA. And this is a theme we're going to come back to is strategy uh, or opportunism, because I think that is going to be a perennial debate about Putin's motives. And, uh, you know, uh, the event recently that, uh, that that we spoke at at uh, at uh, Pushkin House very much focused on that idea of uh, strategy or opportunism. It's an incredibly uh, difficult thing to define, I think. But if we come to something you mentioned there, which is threat. Can I actually just jump in oh, yeah. right there yes, first? Of course, there, please do. Is, yeah. I think one of the key things when we talk about strategy, that's often confused with goals. Strategy is not just simply, this is what I'd like to see. It is a concrete plan, a roadmap for how you get to that. And, and therefore, I think in this case, I mean, my view is that Putin doesn't have a strategy, but he has goals and he has tactics and he is opportunistic. But anyway, that I just thought I'd just jump in to give, give, throw my own definition in there. Well, I think that's very important, actually. And I think it actually ladders up to the, to, to the next question, which is this idea of threat, because... You know, in the Cold War, we had a clear set of threats. The Soviet Union was the threat, etc. It wasn't going to go away until there was some fundamental change. Half of Europe essentially is occupied and coerced into being, you know, the uh, the foot soldiers of of of, uh, of Russia, uh, of the Soviet Union, and so that that was a clearly defined kind of threat. Of course, in the nineties, we almost immediately decided there was no threat and uh, disarmed. And, uh, you know, that's when our artillery pieces are heavy armor and and all that kind of stuff. And I was learning Russian at the time, you know, all that lovely money that came from the MOD to fund Russian departments that all suddenly disappeared in the in the 90s. So our perception of threat is is um, I would say it is it is not always on. It's not a permanent sense of, uh, dare I say, inbuilt paranoia. If we turn to Russia, I think they have a very different sense of threat, and I'd love to hear your your view on that. Um, threat seems to be something that is ever present and has a layer of paranoia, perhaps uh, dating to the revolution, uh, etc., and the sort of KGB mindset. But threat doesn't seem to be something that's ever gone away. It's therefore it's ever present. Therefore, aggression in one form or another uh, isn't something that is punctuated. It is something that is always happening at one level or another is is that uh, overly simplistic or no i mean but i think the interesting thing is here is you kind of conflate threat and aggression and in many ways i think the russians themselves actually believe themselves to be shall we say offensively defensive i mean it, okay in, in britain is easy well when was the last time we had a serious invasion of britain and the answer is 1066 Whereas Russia 
by virtue of its size, its location, it's at the crossroads of Eurasia, has throughout its history essentially been vulnerable to whichever is the rising military power of the age. Whether we're talking about horse nomads culminating in the Mongols coming from the east, whether we're talking about the very creation, I mean, the notion of Rus, you know, where does the word Rus comes from? Rodsi, which was a, a Finnish word for rowers, which was basically used for the Vikings, who, and at this point, I begin to start to begin to channel Vladimir Putin and his half hour start to his uh, infamous Tucker Carlson interview, but precisely with the 19th century, essentially invasion of these territories by, by Vikings. At other times, it's been the Teutonic Knights, it's been Napoleon, it's been Hitler, it's been the Khanates from the south, the Kazan and Crimea and, and such like, all of these have at different times not just nibbled away at the edges of the territories of Muscovy, Russia, call it what you will, but actually pose serious existential threats. How many times has Moscow been burned by different enemies? How many times has it been occupied, whether we're talking about the Poles or whether we're talking about the Mongols? So in this context, theirs is a sense that absolutely to be to be weak, to be divided, is to be vulnerable. And this is very much at the heart of kind of Putin's reordering, what it politely, of Russian history, to give it this nice, clear narrative that more or less says we have a manifest destiny, but also we are constantly a threat. And in, in that context, absolutely, when you can't rely on natural borders, when you're not a convenient island or similar, there is that sense of, you know, we, we always could find... Um, a generally more technologically and, and societally advanced nation outside our borders that poses a threat. And in that context, often the best answer in the sort of this Russian strategic culture is precisely to, to, to move first because you are a lumbering slower brute. I mean, the classic example of that being the beginning of the First World War, where you had Russia painfully aware that if it waited for Germany, which was saying, we don't want a big war, but if it waited for Germany to mobilize, Germany could mobilize so much more quickly than, than, than Russia could. So it's that question of, well, do you take the, the Germans at face value? And if you're right, then that's good. There's no war. But if you're wrong, you're going to start a war at a massive disadvantage. Or do you play safe? I mean, ironically, destroying your country. But do you play safe and strike first? So that's always been this, this Russian dilemma. Is if you constantly regard yourself in, is being in an insecure strategic environment, is the best means to simply hunker down or to strike first? And that's an interesting one because you know I was I was about to say my my Ukrainian Georgian Finnish audience are going to be jumping up and down, um, shouting the word provocation. But I think you've sort of answered that. It's it's out of paranoia and a fear of threat of invasion that you strike first. But to those who you're striking, that is going to appear like nothing less than than imperialism uh, and outright aggression, not from somebody whose borders are threatened, but from somebody who has no concept of its borders and who threatens others. So this this idea of of threat kind of cuts two ways. And of course, if you speak to anybody on the borders of Russia or right into Central Europe and all those who join NATO, um, not from the expansion, but from a very real fear uh, of talking to their parents, grandparents, of what it's like to be occupied, you know, that idea of Russia as a threat is just as real to those who have to live as its neighbours than it is to those in the Kremlin who perhaps have no real sense of where their borders actually lie. Well, this is it. I mean, it demonstrates the truth of a, a very sophisticated uh, geostrategic uh, precept, which is that it sucks to have a border with Russia. Um, you know, this is pre precisely the point. And again, I mean, the reason I sort of stress this is because there is an inevitable desire to look for a geopolitical baddie just as you know, that way it demonstrates that we are the geopolitical goodies. And I mean, for me, I see this, and obviously it's a, it's a tragedy for all those various countries that Russia has through the ages in, invaded. Um, but it's also actually a tragedy for Russia because precisely, you know, it, it constantly finds itself in this position where, you know, yes, individual governments, individual rulers may think otherwise, but, you know, if we're thinking about the, you know, the country in its grand strategic context, there is that point that, that it never really knows at what point it can think itself secure. Now, ironically, nuclear weapons should have given it that security. And frankly, in a more 
I don't necessarily want to say rational, but but certainly, so shall, shall I say, kind of mature geopolitical understanding. You know, Russia could could well have appreciated that that it was now pr pretty much secure. The problem is, of course, that from Putin's point of view, what he faced was a hybrid war, and he interpreted wrongly, clearly, everything from you know, the, the color revolutions to the revolution of dignity in Ukraine, not as natural and organic expressions of internal politics and revulsion at uh, corrupt and unresponsive governments, but precisely as plots by the evil manipulative West, the CIA, and of course, God bless it, the MI MI6. Even the um, rise of the internet. I mean, this is because that's my domain. Even oh. that he saw as not an organic technological revolution, but something engineered to threaten Russia. Of course, of course. You know, all of it. I mean, look, and again, this is the danger of we you don't. Know, Putin clearly has some extraordinary paranoias and some extraordinary ignorances. Um, and in part, this is Putin and in part, this is actually wider. But I think particularly, look, you know, these take Putin himself. This is, a, this is a man who has had not one, but two authoritarian regimes collapse around him, East Germany and the Soviet Union. And I think that has left him with sort of a deep scarring and a, a sense of the constant uh, precarious nature of power. And so all of these things, you know, whereas once upon a time, you know, it was the humble photocopier. You know, let's remember the Soviet Union, after all, you know, was so paranoid about the power of the photocopier to be able to distribute subversive material that every single one was registered by the police and every single one had a, had a ledger in which everything that was done had, had to be sort of written down. Ludicrous. But nonetheless, it reflects this concern that information is something that um, can can become this, this vital sort of threat against the regime. No, we could push it even further back. Nicholas I, Tsar Nicholas I, one of the most sort of militaristic and severely authoritarian of, of recent, of later Tsars. Actually, under him, his censors, for example, censored a cookery book because there was one line talking about a free flow of air to the oven, which was somehow deemed to be subversive. So, I mean, I think, you know, in, in this respect, the Internet actually, yes, of course, it's a very different kind of tool, you know, an extraordinary different scale. But nonetheless, it just simply follows in to this notion that essentially through information, the state can become vulnerable and thus control of the information is every bit as important to security as having enough troops and soldiers, uh, troops and uh, you know, military materiel to dispose of. And geography also i think leads to and this is going to be very uh very broad woolly question here um but it does hit the button of anthropology that appears in your uh, in your bio um and this is again the the land of russia being so vast um it can not just sort of lead to a certain isolation or a certain uh sense of turning inwards um there is definitely there's exceptionalism that, of course, goes with or a sense of exceptionalism that goes with all former empires. I mean, let's face it, you know, the the, the English, uh, the French, um, the US, we all have exceptionalism to one degree or another coded into our into our mental DNA, as it were. But Russians seem to have a, a very deep rooted uh, sense of exceptionalism, uh, uniqueness and so on. And throughout doing these interviews, this has come through over and over, despite there being commonalities, problems with sort of corruption, bureaucracy, you know, horizontal versus vertical struggles. There's there's lots of commonality, but there seems to be one thing, which is Russians, very broadly speaking, are less inclined to seek lessons and learnings from others, but to seek internal solutions and to think that they have to come up with some unique solution for their unique circumstances. Whereas Ukrainians, many people are spoken to the military who do training, but also in, in technology and so on, say Ukrainians are like a sponge. They're able to sort of retain their own sense of identity, but are absolutely open to all sorts of other influences. Now, maybe this comes from geography as a, as a borderland to survive. Maybe you, you have to have that. Um, but... The question is coming here. This seems, in my view, to be working against the Russian opposition. This idea of exceptionalism means that they are less inclined to learn the lessons of Maidan or learn the lessons uh, from being living and, and traveling abroad, less inclined to maybe even cooperate amongst themselves in order to try and defeat uh, Putin's regime. I know that's a very broad and woolly question, but uh, yeah, what do you make of that? Okay, well, let me make three points in response to that. I mean, first of all, 
let me make myself massively unpopular with a very large segment of your of your um, listeners. I think there is a danger in because clearly, you know, they are the victims of, of Russian aggression and so forth, and, and they're the ones who are trying to democratize and become close to the West. Of sometimes actually being a little bit too rosy tinted in our perspective of the Ukrainians. And I'm not saying this in any way to bash the Ukrainians or whatever, but in some ways, because I think that there are risks in that. I, I, I draw the parallel with the excessive optimism around the Ukrainian counteroffensive of last year, which turned out to be much, much less successful for a variety of reasons than hoped which led to an inevitable pendulum swing the other way. And therefore, people saying, look, it's clear that the you know the Russians can't be dislodged, the Ukrainians can't win, and therefore we, we need to think of an alternative solution. So this is, a, this is why I'm, I'm a little concerned about being a little bit too rosy in our perspective of the Ukrainians, because then that runs the risk of, of giving us more, more problems later on, when it turns out that, gosh, they're just humans like, like the rest of us. And frankly, you know, most Ukrainians... Um, you know, or sort of mo much of Ukraine's history has been as part of a, of, of a state with, with, with the rest of Russia. So it's not quite so different. I think, obviously, one of the things is this. If you talk about exceptionalism, it's always an interesting comparison with the United States. These are countries which, you know, for a long time had no real borders and they just continue to extend into what they regarded as virgin territory. I mean, even though there are actually people living there who might have had a different perspective. But you might say... And, and again, I'm, I'm caricaturing here, but to a large extent, the American drive westwards was a bit of because of opportunity. There's more land, there, there, there's gold, there's whatever, you know, let's just move a bit further. There are buffaloes we can eat and whatever else. So keep, keep going. Whereas the Russian drive across Siberia, Central Asia, eastwards, was often actually not because of opportunity, but again, a perception of threat. Sometimes it's a threat of there's instability on your borders. You, we're gonna, I mean, this carnate is now raiding our people and um, therefore we need to teach it a lesson. And actually then when they fight back, well, we're going to have to just occupy it. Sometimes it's another kind of, opportunity, of, of risk, an economic one. Peasants fleeing the, the heavy handed you know, taxation and impositions of duties of the state and the landlords looking for new territories. And then, well, you can't let them just flee. You have to go after them or merchants out there getting you know, soft gold, in other words, furs or whatever else. Well, we need to tax them because otherwise they, they are essentially stealing from from the czar. So for all these reasons, actually, a lot of the drive eastwards was not because some czar said, wouldn't it be great to control Siberia? But, you know, a piecemeal expansion because of problems on the borders. So, again, we already have this sort of, you know, optimistic there's opportunities, pessimistic, there's risks, notions. But when we bring it to exceptionalism, I mean, I think that, look, the Russians are very, very able and willing to take technological and other, shall we say, kind of specific lessons from the West or whoever else. I mean, if you look at the degree to which actually we're seeing Chinese forms of population control um, through, you know, facial recognition cameras and everything else being introduced, I mean, they'll 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 take whatever they they do they they, they can find. And if you look at, for example, the Russian language, I mean, the degree to which there are loan words from, say, Dutch or English in everything to do with the Navy actually mirrors the way that they, they basically imported piecemeal technologies and the specialists to run them. So on the one hand, the Russians are perfectly willing to be magpies. And as I said, that that's encoded in their language. The problem is more, I think, this notion of um, can Russia actually accommodate these lessons? I mean, there is still within many within the Russian opposition a sense that somehow Russia is just too big or the, the weight of its history is too great that you just can't just simply import. You can't just simply say, well, you know, should we have a German system, a British system or an American system and we'll just take it in? Um, and look, that's that, that's not unique to Russians, but often in other countries, sort of change happens either because it's imposed from, from above. Think of what happened in Germany, where basically the Allies wrote the constitution for it, or indeed Japan, or else it happens kind of organically. The problem at the moment for the opposition is, in some ways, they're in a position where they have no power but all but lots of responsibility. They have to sort of, or they're, well, they're expected to be able to come up with some grand answer of how do you tr transition a country from being a hollowed out sham of constitutionalism 
that is essentially just an authoritarian, almost medieval system, to something that is this modern and forward-looking, and not just 20th, but 21st century in its aspirations. And, you know, how, how can they possibly do that? And the answer is they can't. And the, 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 um, the other sort of, I would suggest, problem that they face is precisely that, that um, Russia's, Russia's dissidents and rebels have often been expected to come up with a grand programmatic solution whether we're talking about the populists in the 19th century or the Bolsheviks who sort of came to power and suddenly realized that Marx never told them all the nuts and bolts. You know, how do you run public transport systems? Who is in charge of sewerage? You know, all of that kind of stuff. You can read through Das Kapital many a time if you're that masochistic and you won't find the answers. But again, somehow they're expected to come out. I'm it. not sure I want to repeat that, uh, <laughs> that trauma <laughs> No, exactly. So I think for all of these reasons, again, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a long answer. because I think it's really interesting. I mean, I think that the, the real problem for the Russian opposition is not so much exceptionalism. I think exceptionalism is um, often what is invoked to explain rather than the actual cause. It is the fact that, firstly, too many opposition figures do not really believe that they are going to be in a position to actually manifest their programs so they can indulge in fantasy politics because there's no responsibility there. There's too much factionalism, which again is in part a result of the, the lack of hope. And, and thirdly, I think that one of, the, one of the really effective elements of Putinism was precisely the way that it... Um, pretended to be so many modern things you know it was it was a democracy it was it was a kind of a technocracy all of these kind of things and i think just as the soviet experience left a taint over anything that looks vaguely leftist so too the 1990s which was notionally a period of capitalism and so forth but was in fact actually a period of banditry has left a taint over anything kind of liberal capitalist and so forth. And so in some ways, this question of, well, what's left? Yes, exactly. I mean, what, what, and another thing that maybe ties in the idea of threat with what we're seeing at the moment is the idea of inheritance as well, that not only do you have uh, the big picture threat to, you know, Russia, et cetera, but actually you also have the threat to the individual ruler and they may be uh, more secure and they may be able to indulge in, as you say, the simulacrum of, of democracy and pull that off, which, of course, until 2012, Putin did spectacularly. But as you get older, as maybe cognitive decline sets in, and there are perhaps signs of that, increasing paranoia, frustration, boredom, etc., um, you have a problem essentially of inheritance. And you then have a problem that you do not have a mechanism to pass power, status, influence cleanly to the next generation. And isn't it ironic that it's not only Putin's inheritance that's come up and, and we see these incredible problems and pressures uh, as, as his position comes under threat. It's a generational thing because all the oligarchs made their money from scratch at the same time as he did. They're also coming up for a generational transition of status, power and wealth within the system, um, which which almost goes sort of unnoticed. So the question here is, until you get until you have a transition mechanism, uh, Russia is going to continue to suffer from these periodic collapses and failures to transition whatever was good about the previous era to the next era. Yeah, I mean, it is it is interesting the way that um, in so many ways, Putinism is beginning to resemble late Soviet, you know, pre-Gorbachevian era, you know, sort of gerontocracy of people clinging desperately, in some cases through one or two little deaths, um, to their position because everything rests on that. And look, I, I still wonder, and this is entirely speculative, if actually one of the motivations behind Putin's inv full-scale invasion in 22 was that sense of, you know, he thought it was going to be a quick and easy triumph. And if he had that quick and easy triumph under his belt, maybe then he would be safe enough, you know, su sufficiently elevated into the pantheon of Russian state-building heroes that he could actually step down from the presidency 
build some kind of nice sinecure for himself as kind of father of the nation or something, but eventually abandon a job which seemed to have become increasingly onerous and tedious for him at his age. Of course, didn't work out quite like that. And now I think he's pretty much stuck because precisely he knows that in this kind of system, which is not, I mean, there is a lot of law. There is a lot of law-based governance at the lower level, but at the top level, absolutely not. It's entirely about personal power. And therefore, whatever the guarantees he might try and build in, his, his fortune, his future, his security would be in the hands of his successor. And he got an example of what that means in January of 2022, when we, we saw the sort of what was an effect a coup within Kazakhstan that saw former President Nazarbayev um, stepping down from his position as, as chair of a sort of you know, key security council that was, he was meant to be his for life, but he, of his own accord, chose to step down because he had become inconvenient for his successor. So absolutely, this, this, this is the problem, the personalization of, of power combined with two things. One, the lack of rule of law. So you can't be secure that, well, the money you put away or the position you got or the perks you know, are, are, are protected can you know, continue after your, your time in power. But also the deinstitutionalization. I mean, this is the interesting thing. In some ways, Russia today is in an even worse position than the Soviet Union was, because the Soviet Union, at least it had the Communist Party which, whatever bad things one can say about it, did represent a kind of institutional power structure which had its own rules and which ultimately chose a leader and could depose a leader, as Khrushchev in due course find, found out to his, his peril. There is nothing like that. I mean, the United Russia bloc is, is not in any way a political party, let alone one that could, could sort of turn against Putin. So in, in some ways, you know, we had the complete hollowing out of everything that makes a state a state. And also because Putin's legitimacy is based on these sham elections and the constitution around it, there's not even that sense of a kind of reciprocal trade of rights and duties. This is not feudalism, because feudalism is actually rested on the fact that the monarch is the monarch, but the monarch also appreciates that there are a whole variety of duties that are owed the people below. This is just more like, you know, basically oriental despotism. And that that's an interesting comparison, isn't it? Because I'm fascinated by the Middle Ages, which uh, I think is controversially I see as being relatively democratic era in that distribution of wealth. There's not as much, you know, gap between the super incredibly rich and and, and everybody else, and, and and the living standards are not quite there. But you have division of powers to an extent. The church has some sense of agency and independence. You have boyars. You have but now what you've got in Russia, it's almost like the singularity of power, the various organs and institutions that had at least some kind of nominal competition have collapsed into, into one. Now you might completely challenge that point of view, but you've got church, state, legislature, especially church and belief, essentially an arm of the FSB. They All these have converged into a single point of authority. I won't say that it's in complete control of everything, because I know that there's under the surface there's an awful lot of competition, and it's uh, you know Putin's chairman of the board rather than. But what you've got is a sort of monocracy, where really all of those institutions have started to dissolve and collapse. You don't have Communist Party and FSB. You sort of have, if you believe the sort of uh, Felicitinsky hypothesis, you, the FSB has basically absorbed everything. Yes, I don't accept the Solzhenitsky hypothesis. I mean, I think that the, the point is this, that absolutely power at the top of the system is, is concentrated in, in one person, an increasingly fallible great decider. But the interesting thing is that so much of his power and his system depends precisely on the presence of multiple competing, though often overlapping, institutions and factions and bodies and individuals. That's how Putin has stayed in power directly and indirectly for 24 years, is that he has people he can trade off against each other. Now, that obviously depends on him being able to do a good job of knowing when disputes are going to become dysfunctional and stepping in to resolve them. Now, he failed dramatically, evidenced in the Prigozhin mutiny. That was a situation where you know, there were people who were telling him this is getting dangerous, but nonetheless, out of, I think, uh, frankly, timidity, he's not actually a risk taker, 
And because he didn't really know who whether to, to back Prigozhin or Defence Minister Shoigu, and his attempts to basically make everyone play nice weren't working, you know, he, he let this go on too long until it exploded into something that, you know, and everyone realises that that was Putin's failure. But it does mean, I think, there are numerous institutions and, and, and bodies of power. The FSB, for example, yes, of course, the FSB has, has a lot of influence and significance. But on the other hand, you know, one could say, well, if push came to shove, who has more men with guns? It's not the FSB. Um, the church. Yes, there is a, you know, a certain degree of, of penetration. But on the other hand, the church has its own interests and its own power. I think this is what's interesting is that we have a system in which there are all kinds of different institutions which actually would have certain capabilities to, to limit the power of the monarch. The problem is, in some ways, the very lack of any kind of mechanism for how they do that. You know, when it comes down to it, in some ways, one of the reasons why Prigozhin did what he did was because that was all he had there was no alternative route uh, you know he, he had tried to persuade putin putin wasn't listening he tried to contact putin you know actually putin refused to hear you know basically, basically to talk to him prigozhin's uh, access pass to the kremlin was revoked so in that situation prigozhin was, was was forced into a position where he had a choice of either submitting to his enemies or trying a ridiculous gamble. And also because Prigozhin was still very much informed by the whole prison culture that you don't back down, and to back down is to basically humiliate yourself. You know, he talked himself into, in, into that position. But again, you see, it, it's not that there weren't mechanisms there. It's not that there weren't institutions. You know, if, for example, I don't know, the, the National Guard, rather than just simply largely sitting this one out, had actually decided, oh, Prigozhin's got a point. You know, things could have been very different. So I, I don't think it's that there's a lack of, of other institutions. I think what there is, is a lack of any mechanism, short of political Armageddon, in which actually they, they can manifest themselves. And so instead, you actually have a kind of governance by stealth. The fact of the matter is, Putin is largely quite a lazy autocrat. There's a lot of things he's, he's not interested in. I mean, he expects just sort of magically elves off stage to handle all the governance. He just says what he wants to happen. And he doesn't really care how it happens in the main. And so this actually gives considerable leeway to what we could consider the technocrats, the staff. You know, whether we're talking about the cabinet of ministers, whether we're talking about the chairwoman of the central bank or whatever, you know, they often actually have done some extraordinarily effective governance. You know, one looks at just how well they have resisted sanctions. I mean, it's clear, frankly, that they've been smarter than we have. Ilvir and Nabulina. I mean, that is quite a Absolutely. job she's pulled there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is it. Um, you know, but and it's clear. Look, she's you know clearly not a supporter of of the invasion. Um, she's clearly very unhappy with the way things are going. But when when it comes down to it, you know, if if you are both stuck in that position, but also essentially a patriot, you, you may not want the war, but you would rather Russia not be destroyed in the, in the context. You do your best, but this is it. You often you do your best despite Putin. You see which things you don't need to ask him about. You see what you can manage until the day comes when, because someone else has whispered in his ear, Putin stops you from doing it. So it, it, it's a deeply dysfunctional process. It's a, I mean, I think this, this is the issue. And it's one in which I think there are all kinds of different power groups and they all have their own interests. But again, at the moment, it's hard to create some kind of consensus. I mean, to go back, I didn't, properly answer, well, at all answer, your issue about the oligarchs. So let, let me pick up on that. I mean, you're absolutely right that Russia is on the cusp of this extraordinary intergenerational transfer of wealth. And the interesting thing is, if we see what happens in similar circumstances in other countries and other times, actually, this gen tends to create a strong impulse for the imposition of rule of law. On the principle of once you've stolen everything, you want to legitimate it. And this is one of the reasons why I am still unfashionably optimistic about Russia's long-term prospects post-Putin, in that I think the people who will dominate after that, the next political generation, the 50-somethings and the 60-something-year-olds, are ruthless, self-interested, pragmatic kleptocrats. But precisely for that reason, they have an interest in, in actually bringing in a certain rule of law to, to fix and protect what they have, rather than leaving it constantly at, at the whim of the state. Um, but again, I think the trouble is at the moment, how do you do anything about it? This is the key thing. Who's the first person to start making the conversations when everyone is terrified that they're being their phones are being intercepted and the person they're talking to might be an FSB informant? 
And how do you actually mobilize in any meaningful way against Putin and the state? So for most people, they're just basically keeping their heads down and hoping that, that fate or mortality will, will do the job for them. And of course, if you read Andrei Soldatov's stuff, he's in you know, a fantastic investigations. You do get the impression that, of course, I mean, Navalny's team is almost certainly penetrated or monitored closely, and the same for for every other major, you know, diaspora so-called oppositional group um, will be extremely closely monitored, if not a process of actively trying to subvert that. I'd like to turn to this idea of informality because I think. Not only is this sort of slightly dysfunctional system of informal power relations uh, using, you know, business networks, etc., not just to make money, but to exert influence and so on. Um, it's not just confined to Russia. We see that actually that that is a, a form of strategy. Um, it's maybe not really aligned with with uh, a sort of rule of law way of doing business. Um, but we see Russia also using that as a tactic. It used it quite effectively to try and coerce and collapse the Ukrainian state. It's uh, using it to an extent in Serbia, Slovakia, Hungary, you know, informal business networks, mafia networks, trade, setting up businesses. It's, it's using this sort of projection of its way of doing business to gain some sort of le leverage or control over various countries, or at least their decision-making process, and of course, it's much more efficient. You don't have to invade if you can get countries to sort of align with your interests without actually having to invade and dominate them. And that seems to be meeting some success. I'd like to throw maybe the controversial idea in here that whereas Poland is meeting or exceeding its defense commitments to NATO, it's sort of 3.89%, I think. So on the one hand, you've got this extraordinary investment in defense against an aggressive Russia, but internally, you've got farmers, and it's highly questionable uh, whether they are genuine, uh, you know, representative of farmers or transport workers, um, blockading Ukraine. There's very close links to these informal networks or, or other, dare I even say, active measures. And they're not blocking the import of Russian grain, vast quantities via Belarus. To me, that's extremely indicative of some degree of success of Russia's uh, you know, penetration or destabilization of the countries around Ukraine. It, it, do you share that? And should we be incredibly worried by that? I don't necessarily see this as something that Russia has done to other countries. I think that what the Russians are demonstrating is an exceedingly strong capability to take fullest advantage of the things that we don't do, the things that we claim to do. I mean, actually, you know, if, if one looks at, for example, this notion of, of kind of strategic corruption and the like, it's not actually that the Russians are unable just simply to wander in and force people to take their money. I mean, they take advantage of places where there is, a, you know, frankly, an, an ingrained corruption culture, which is why Ukraine was so vulnerable, because basically Ukraine was, you know, back in, in the Yanukovych days, it was much more corrupt than Russia. And of course, the Russians therefore regarded that as an opportunity. But elsewhere, where there are, for example, uh, minority communities defined politically, ethnically, linguistically, or whatever, who feel disgruntled, the Russians can reach in, they can use their disinformation campaigns to whip up and, and radicalize. But again, they can't change. They can't take someone who is a loyal citizen of a country and on the whole to flip them around until, until they're sort of dissatisfied. I mean, you know, we've seen so many examples of, of the, you know, the research that's been done from everything from that, everything from Brexit to the American elections to the European elections. That's not within the capability. What they do is they radicalize existing feelings. Likewise, where there are countries which have weak controls over, for example, election financing and the like, well, again, the Russians will take fullest advantage of this. But this is the point. Um, in some ways, I think the Russians are sometimes something of a scapegoat. It allows us not to consider our own failings because we can just simply say Putin done it. More often, I think actually the Russians are precisely um, exploiting, but also in the, in the process showing us the failings in our own system. And Often, actually, the impact is 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 less than we might think. I mean, for example, a lot of spoken spoke about in the UK about the sort of the, the supposed impact of, of of Russian dirty money sloshing through the city of London, which absolutely it does, as everyone else's dirty money also sloshes through the city of London. But the point is, if one looks at 
what actual impact does this tend to sort of have on on the political process? In practice, actually, the, you know, those people who are able to mobilize this money, they're using it to make sure they get planning permission so that they can build a bigger swimming pool in their basement rather than actually trying to sort of shift the axis of government. Because otherwise, well, why would, would Britain be one of Ukraine's most staunch defenders and also regarded as one of the most uh, you know, vicious and um, clandestine of, 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 of Russia's foes? I think so they've generally... labelled us the main bastards. I think that was one of the top well. That was I mean, there's, 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 there's a lot of things, and there's almost <laughs> like a kind of a, a competition in the sort of the toxic element of, of of the Russian media environment, precisely to come up with that. But it is fascinating how they still regard Britain as being so powerful. I mean, it's also quite heartening. Um, nice to know that someone thinks we still we still count. But no, but so so broadly speaking, look, is this a threat? Yes, absolutely. Are the Russians using this insofar as they can? Absolutely. But as I say, firstly, they just simply use the opportunities that we give them. Secondly, though, we also have to recognize the limits. I mean, even if one takes countries like, say, Serbia, or even some European countries where one could point the finger. I mean, I wouldn't want to mention Bulgaria, but you know, who knows? Austria, maybe. Um, yeah. Austria, exactly. But even then, ultimately, they can't buy a country. They can sometimes rent it for a short period of time. You know, Serbia itself, it's happy to, you know, back when, when the Soviets still had spare weapons and, and aircraft, they'll happily take hand-me-downs from Russia. But on the other hand, they also know that Russia is not in a position to provide massive amounts of development aid. And that's why you, know, you also have Serbia making very strong overtures to join the European Union, because that's where the money is. Um, so, you know, I, again, I think that even amongst those who, who would seem to be Russia's allies, there is that sense that it's, well, what can we get out of it now? So to go back to the, the Polish example, look, I mean, the issue is, frankly, that we have a, a dysfunctional European agricultural sector that rests on subsidies in many ways to maintain certain inefficient practices. And there's a lot of genuine fears. One thing to import cheap grain from via Belarus. That does not, as it were, distort the overall sort of mechanism. There is a sense that, that if Ukraine joins the European Union, which is looking quite, quite likely, and I, I hope it happens, but nonetheless, that will dramatically change the whole balance of, of, of systems there. So it's not actually, I mean, the, the Polish, Polish farmers are necessarily anti-Ukrainian. They're anti something that, that could dramatically impact their quality of life. And then this is when the Russians come in. And absolutely, this is the, it, it, it's the radicalizing. They take an existing sentiment and they say, and that's why you must protest or else it'll be too late. And they help nudge. You know, what in many cases I'm sure is an entirely um, domestic uh, sort of wave of, of, of sentiment, just do what they can to push it into a convenient uh, configuration. Pouring petrol on the flames, giving a bit of structure or, uh, you know, uh, some edge to to that. I mean, it, it, it does seem to be in this instance, particularly designed to weaponize a difficult situation by blocking not just grain, but, you know, thousands of shipments of various humanitarian and military aid. I mean, it, it, it's it's having a potentially a dangerous effect, although it has been pointed out, you could stick most of that onto trains and it's a much more efficient. You can deliver a lot more stuff there. So there are still potentially ways out. But how does this relate to the Russian military doctrine? Because we focus very much on the physical violence that we can see uh, in Ukraine. But according to Russian military doctrine, that's only one small part of the overall strategy that's adopted. You know, informational hybrid techniques are the ones that, are potentially far more economical and you try those first before you go and do the physical invasion because that's costly and that comes with higher risks so do we focus on the tip of the iceberg uh, especially in the media which is the sort of physical aggression and do we miss you know really the, the the depths of the iceberg which is a lot of stuff that we aren't necessarily preparing for creating resilience for etc yeah i think this there's in some ways two different strands of Russian thinking that we need to be aware of. There is how the military think about political and, and informational operations, which is very much what in Western parlance would be considered shaping operations. So in other words, you are still envisaging sending in your troops, but you want to ensure that when they do go in, they go in in a situation where, where the battlefield is tilted as far as possible to their advantage. So that precisely you have 
undermined the morale of the enemy soldiers, that you have shattered the coherence of the enemy society, that you have broken the chain of command, and, and so it goes. So, but, but as I said, that is really, in, as far as the military are concerned, a, a preparation for the inevitable shooting bit. However, what we've also see is a, a separate strand of thinking that comes from within what we could think more the civilian security establishment, particularly focused around the Secretariat of the Security Council. I mean, the Security Council itself is the body that brings together all the key figures within the Russian security state. And it's not really an important body. I mean, it's important because obviously the people there are all important who are sitting around the table, but it's not a body at which actually decisions are made. It's more one which is kind of where formally sort of decisions are announced and a few particular sort of interdepartmental wrangles can be resolved. However, the Security Council Secretariat, the, the body that is there notionally to support the Security Council, that has become increasingly crucial. And in my opinion, it is really that the hub of Russian strategic thinking in this context, certainly more important than, say, the foreign ministry or, or any other aspect. And this is obviously un under Nikolai Patrushev, Putin's de facto national security advisor and a man who I, I mean, I described as the most dangerous man in Russia because his hawkishness in some ways can make Putin look relatively moderate in some ways. Um, and within that, that secretariat, what we have seen over the last decade is the emergence of thinking that sees these non-military forms of warfare not simply as a supplement to kinetic operations, but also in appropriate circumstances an alternative. And they embrace something that really goes back to, well, George Kennan, um, the, the, the American scholar diplomat and the architect of American early Cold War thinking, who described it as political warfare, the use of all means at a nation's disposal short of war, overt, covert, legal, illegal, to essentially ensure national sort of uh, goals are, are met. And I think this is this is what, what's crucial, because this is why I don't like the term hybrid war, because it carries with it the implication that where there's information, then there's going to be shooting. And so it's almost like, well, when are the little green men going to come in? Whereas actually, I think political war is much more a useful concept, and I think it's much more um, effectively reflects how the Russians themselves, or certainly the, you know, the, the key Russians and leadership think of it, is that in fact, these are all just as good. And absolutely against an enemy, and let's be honest, from their point of view, we are the enemy because we are at war with them. You know, and I think in fairness, they're, they're right here and we're wrong. We sort of pretend, oh no, no, we're just imposing sanctions on the Russians. We're just arming the Ukrainians. Well, I think the Russians see, well, sanctions is economic warfare. And arming the Ukrainians is proxy war. So I think that except that, uh, well, mm -hmm. it, it only takes one side to decide that there's a war. I, I, I think that the, 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 the notion that there are whole gradations of warfare, I think, is an important and crucial one. But I think in, in a, from their point of view, look, NATO is basically bulletproof. Now, who knows what might happen in the future? But certainly for the moment, and frankly, I think for the foreseeable future, Article 5 is a solid and meaningful guarantee. And in fact, for the Russians, I think it's probably even more solid than for us, because they don't really see NATO as uh, an association of countries freely coming together to defend each other. They see NATO as America's Warsaw Pact. So when we have the debates about whether a Southern European nation would fight for Estonia or whatever, they don't think that that your Southern European nation would have a choice. So, I mean, in that context, if, if, if NATO is off the table in any kind of military context, well, what do you do? Do you just simply throw up your hands and say, well, what a shame, there's nothing we can do? No, of course not. You move into the alternative sphere. I mean, I call this guerrilla geopolitics. When you're facing an enemy that is more powerful, and let's be honest, NATO is more powerful. It has more ground troops than the Russians do, who are more technologically advanced and in the most cases better. So fine. So you instead move the sphere of conflict to where we are regarded as weak and the Russians are regarded as strong. And in this context, as far as Putin is concerned, it's the fact that we are a constellation of democracies with our own internal divisions, different interests and so forth, which obviously we we're very happy about, but nonetheless creates vulnerabilities that can be exploited. So I think that's a reason. So this is a very, very long answer, I know. But I, I think it's important to kind of disaggregate these two kind of types of, of doctrine, shall we say. And this is why absolutely we have been, just as we have been frankly laggard in addressing our conventional kinetic security, 
so too have we on the whole been catastrophically bad at actually protecting ourselves and creating not just the resilience, but, but the active defense that we need in all the non-military forms of war. I mean, if you look, for example, however big the disparities are in proportion of GDP spent on the military, if you look, for example, at the disparity between proportions of GDP spent on intelligence and counterintelligence operations, I mean, it is orders of magnitude wider. And, you know, if you look at, well, I mean, let, let me name and shame Belgium. Belgium has spent catastrophically little until recently on defending against Russian intelligence. It's one of the reasons why everyone knows that even today, even with all the expulsions, Brussels is still an espionage playground. Um, you know, and it also happens to be not just the, the capital of the European Union, but what's nearby NATO and shape. Now, they obviously have their own security. But, you know, in this kind of context, I think it's clear that, you know, actually, I hesitate to say Putin's done us a favour. But nonetheless, Putin has identified for us the kind of vulnerabilities which we might find being exploited by other more powerful threats in the future, say China, at a time when maybe we still have time to be able to do something about it. And certainly the Ukrainians seem to be learning that lesson. The extraordinary intensity of warfare on all fronts does seem to be building a certain innovation and resilience in Ukraine. It's by no means perfect, but there is a culture of innovating in a variety of, uh, dare I say, it, sort of, you know, like a, a political immune system response. It's it's developing and it's in a better shape than perhaps ours is. So, you know, aggression may have uh, an inverse effect that actually it kind of makes us stronger. I've got two questions really kind of remaining. One's uh, another broad and fuzzy question. Uh, in fact, they both are. So apologies for that. Um, the first one here is about strategy. I mean, it seems to me that the West does not really have a strategy for Ukrainian victory. Britain perhaps is on the edge of that having fewer red lines, perhaps a little less concerned about Crimea being a target for, for Ukraine to take back. It seems to me that Berlin and uh, Washington are actually terribly concerned about that and, and not even sure if they want to see that happening. Ukraine, however, does seem to be strategic. They do seem to be thinking in slightly more long term um, in that they clearly have an attritional strategy. They They've worked out over the last year that if it's not going to be a war of movement on the ground, then your movement has to come somewhere else, at sea, in the air, which they're making progress on. But on the ground, they seem to have decided that Russia is going to you know, throw people at us. They're going to learn, but they're going to learn more slowly than we are. They're going to innovate, but they're going to innovate perhaps more slowly than we are. So attrition is a key part of the Ukrainian strategy. If we if, if we take that uh, as, as, as true, and you, you may dispute that, um, Who's going to win the struggle if you have the opportunistic vertical, which could characterize the Russian system versus the more strategic horizontal of Ukraine? Which one of these will actually triumph? Well, let's start with strategy again, Western and Ukrainian. The problem with strategy, again, going back to, to the definition I threw out at the beginning, is you have to have a, a key end point that you're actually seeking to. And that's why there is no Western strategy because there is no Western agreement on quite what the end. And all this talk about, well, we you know, basically it's for the Ukrainians to define victory and we're behind the Ukrainians as long as it takes. Those are mantras that are used to avoid conversation rather than actually anything real. Um, because, of course, it's not true. It's not true that we don't have our, other, our own interests at stake here and that we also have other interests. It's one of the reasons why, I mean, we all talk about the need to support the Ukrainians, but we are not militarizing our economies. No one's budget is suddenly saying, well, actually, no, you know, we need to basically crank up to 10 percent of GDP being spent on defense in order to create the orders which will create the defense industry, which will allow us to properly support Ukraine. There is a huge amount of hypocrisy on this. Now, with the Ukrainians, obviously, it's a, it's a very different situation. But still, I think there, there is a problem in defining victory and defeat. Um, you know, is, is, does, does defeat for Ukraine means that Russia basically has rolled over the whole country and it has its forces on the Romanian border? Highly unlikely. Is defeat that essentially Ukraine becomes a, a sort of neutered uh, country under sort of Russia's shadow? Or if just simply the Russians can hold on to all, all or most of what they've already conquered? Is that defeat? I mean, for some people, that would actually be victory. 
if Ukraine can then develop democratically the way it wants on the other side of that front line. So I think this is the problem until we have a clear sense. And even frankly, if, if one thinks of victory as meaning just pushing every Russian soldier out of every square centimeter of occupied territory, again, quite an ask, but it doesn't end the war. It just simply moves the front line to the national border behind which Putin can continue to reconstitute his forces, throw missiles across the border, etc. So in some ways, I think the problem is no one really has a strategy because even the Russians, I mean, I know what Putin would like in terms of, again, sort of basically bringing Ukraine entirely under his uh, dominion. But to be perfectly honest, I imagine that if, as and when there is any kind of scope for any kind of a deal, he'll just be aiming for the best deal he can get at the time. So everyone is really just kind of slugging away, hoping that at some point, some notion of what is a, a plausible sort of outcome can happen. And in that context, you know, who's going to win? I mean, like, I, I still on the whole feel that Ukraine is going to win in some form. I just can't tell you what that form will be. And in part, it's to go back to your earlier point, because in many ways, Putin has been the father of the Ukrainian nation. That all the old divisions that have constantly, time and time again, hampered Ukraine's attempts at nation building experiments, actually have been swept away by the common experience of invasion. And whether it's, you know, it's Russian speaking or Ukrainian speaking, West or East, Catholic or Orthodox, all of these divisions matter so much less now. But still, we also have to recognize that almost certainly Ukraine has proportionately taken more casualties than Russia has. You know, Russia still has the manpower advantage. And, well, certainly for this year, it's going to have all kinds of other advantages as well. I think we have to brace ourselves. There will be some further bad news coming in 2024 before hopefully a combination of Ukrainian reconstitution and Western arms, well, ammunition manufacturing sort of cranks up to scale. So, I mean, I, I, I honestly don't know. I, I wish I, I wish I had some clear vision of how I think this is going to end out. I mean, I if I had to guess, I would say that this is going to end with with a with a partial Ukrainian victory. Best example is the Finnish Winter War, in which you know Finland, when invaded by the Soviet Union, fought extraordinarily effectively and pushed the Soviets back, and the attempt to basically take over Finland failed. But nonetheless, as the price of peace, Finland lost about ten percent of of, it, of its territory. And, you know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm not going to give any percentage points or whatever, but, you know, it may it may be that we're eventually going to be in a position which de facto the Russians are still in occupation of some territories. And Karelia, the Finland's is, third largest city, you know, I mean, it's yeah. not a, a, an empty territory. It lost a significant mm. territory. Yeah, exactly. But nonetheless, I think on the other side of that border. I mean, I think Ukraine has this extraordinary opportunity, not just to kind of build itself as, as, as a liberal democratic state but also precisely to find itself a place in the European Union and, in my opinion, the only way it can have real security, a part of NATO. And to an extent, defeat in Western countries may well be defined by what electorates think and what the media thinks and how it positions it, whereas someone like Michael Knack has been pointing out from the early months of the war that victory or defeat will be whatever is spun out of the Kremlin and maybe Z patriots and Fianders won't buy it, but the majority of Russians will, you know, they'll, they'll line up behind whatever victory or defeat is defined by, uh, by their sort of informational lords and masters. Well, I mean, I, I shouldn't, I don't think that we should assume that the Russians are that gullible. I mean, let's be honest, even today's information control state is not as all powerful as the Soviet one. And even in Soviet times, People knew full well that they were being lied to. I think it's more that a situation is, look, if, if something happens that can end the war, whether it's actually something that is a genuine Russian victory in any terms, or whether just simply it's what, something that they will spin with, with bare credibility, a majority of Russians will be happy to go along with that. In some cases, precisely because they just simply accept what they're being told by television. But in many cases, because look, this is not a popular war. The majority of Russians would not want this to continue. And therefore, there will almost be a case of everyone conspiring to agree. If it'll just end the war, then, then yes, we'll say it was a great victory. And we, you know, we, we, we can put some statues to soldiers up in the squares, as long as that means that you know, our boys, our husbands and so forth, do not face another mobilization wave to be sent to the meat grinder.
Absolutely. And I think that sort of sort of answers the last question. And it's another broad, woolly, vague philosophical question here. And it's the last one for sure. Um, and that is for Ukrainians, the difference between defeat and victory is stark. It could mean, you know, the loss of your home, your language, your culture. If you're under occupation, it means living in a a uh, place that lacks rule of law, that doesn't have certain certainties and doesn't have opportunity to create wealth, um, as well as in some instances express your identity as as uh, as Ukrainian, in Russian speaking Ukrainian, etc. So the, 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 there's a clear difference between victory and defeat in the Ukrainian mind. I'll make the controversial statement here that for the majority of Russians, there is not that much tangibly different between defeat and victory. What you come away with as an individual, as a family, is really not going to change depending on those two outcomes. Absolutely. Look, on the whole, I mean, and we've seen all kinds of survey data to demonstrate this, Russians, unlike Putin, believe that Ukraine is a different country. Now, there is obviously an element in which they may see a certain blurring around the Donbass, and Crimea is an exception. This is the thing, you know, pretty much every Russian, whether they deify or despise Putin, genuinely thinks that Crimea was rightfully theirs. But the rest, there is, there is no one, no one's sort of sitting there thinking, ah, the homeland is not complete until Kharkiv is, is, is under the Russian tricolor or whatever. So absolutely, I think at the, for the moment, although there is a sort of a, a generic natural patriotism, a sort of rally around the flag to a degree, but given that there are also massive evident costs. You know, most people's quality of life is getting worse. There is the constant fear of, of mobilization um, and, and a, you know, a, a concern about where this goes. That sense of being locked away from, from Europe and you know, most Russians regard themselves as Europeans. Um, you know, all of that carried against it, you know, it means that I think this is why most Russians, they, they don't want to capitulate. They don't want to be humbled and so forth, but nonetheless, they will be delighted by any anything that essentially means the end to this war. Because as you say, for most Russians, all it brings is hardship rather than any kind of benefit. Totally at odds with the experience of the Ukrainians. Well, Mark, thank you so much for being a guest on the channel. Thank you so much for giving your time over to talk uh, so extensively about what's happening and for your fantastic insights into the causes and, of course, how the war is playing out. I look forward to potentially speaking again after the election, when it's possible. We'll see whether more mobilization, more oppression uh, is being rolled out in Russia. But uh, for now, thank you so much. My pleasure.